What's up, Drop Pod listeners? As always, you can listen to the Drop Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Pods. We're excited to announce that we're now on Apple Music, Audible, and Pandora as well. New episodes drop every Wednesday. You can also find all of our content on YouTube at The Drop Golf Podcast and on our socials. That's Instagram and Twitter at The Drop underscore pod. No matter how you consume us, like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff, follow and listen along. This episode is brought to you by the Law Office of Mallon and Tranger. Tom Mallon and Randy Tranger are board certified trial attorneys who share more than 40 years of legal experience. They specialize in personal injury matters, workers' compensation cases, and criminal and municipal defense. As certified trial attorneys, they have recovered millions of dollars on behalf of people injured in accidents and employees injured at work. They have offices conveniently located in Freehold and Point Pleasant. For skilled and personalized legal representation, call Mallon and Tranger at 732-780-0230 or check out their website at tmallonlaw.com. Not only are they good people, they're good golfers too. I hate dumb things. <laughs> this is the Drop Podcast where we talk golfing in the Garden State. I'm Mike Poro, and this is Ryan Kulat. What's going on, everyone? Hope everyone is well. This episode's coming out on March 22nd. Mike, how excited for you. April is right around the corner, the official start to golf season. I know I'm super psyched to get out there. We got a big episode today. Our guest is Stu Hagestead, who is an unbelievable amateur golfer. Uh, we're going to talk about him in a little bit, but we're coming off back-to-back -back national weeks. We're kind of bringing it back this week with Stu, but we had Dan Hicks on, the voice of golf for NBC, two weeks ago. We had Dottie Pepper on last week, Inside the Ropes for CBS. Those were amazing interviews and, and really tremendous people. If you did not listen to those, stop here, go back and listen, because we had a lot of fun with them. This week, we got Stu. Stu won the Met Am in 2016. He was the low amateur at the Masters in 2017. Mike, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but the Masters is held in a little place we like to call Augusta National. Ever heard of it? I have, I have. <laughs> he gets into talking about his experience there and how the low, am, the low am gets to stay in the crow's nest there above the pro shop. And he tells about all the, all the stories. It was really cool to see a behind the scenes or to hear a behind the scenes story of, of what's going on at Augusta. Really, really cool. We had an awesome talk with Stu. Uh, he's a Cali guy uh, at heart, living out there, from out there. Uh, super laid back attitude, but he spent a bunch of time in the in the Met area, winning the winning the Met Open, and you know just just a great guy. It was really really fun talking with him. So another big guest for us this week. So make sure you stick around and listen to that conversation that we had with Stu. Yeah, right. Before we get into today's episode, I mean, listen, Stuart Hagestad. Getting him on the show, I mean, the way I kind of look at this month so far for us is like, we get Dan Hicks, made a birdie. Then we got Dottie Pepper on. We made another birdie. Now we're heading into the par five. We're gettable. And then who comes on? Stuart Hagestad. <laughs> like, I mean, you, I mean, we are chomping at the bit in terms of like big scene type things because, you know, for two, two guys like you and I getting these types of names to pop on, to give us some time. Again, Stu was another guy that I felt like we could talk shop with for a long Hours. time. Yeah. Like, again, I know you've said this so many times, like, long lost buddies. That's how I kind of felt yeah. with Stu. And I think his resume speaks for itself. The dude has played in 25 USGA championships. 25. 25. He's 10th ranked overall in the Wagger, like, mid-am, okay? He's a mid-amateur, and he's 10th ranked overall in the world. You know, number one mid-am guy in the world. So, I mean, you know, she, I, we could probably go on and on about his things, the things that he's accomplished. You know, listen, he's another quality person, a phenomenal amateur, um, which I know a lot of people even say, you know, why doesn't a guy like Stu go pro? And we dive a little bit into that. So definitely, definitely stick around and listen to what Stu has to say. Like you said, long lost friends is always a good way that I like to describe it when you're when you're talking with somebody. We just lost track of time, and I think that's a good test to how 
the conversations going when when everyone's like, oh, I didn't realize that it was, you know, an hour and a half later already or however long it went. So we're going to start today with something that, you know, a little Christmas came early for Mike and I. We both got the perfect practice putting mats sent to us. This is the practice putting mat that professionals use. Uh, DJ's big on it. He's on the cover of the box there for us. It's incredible technology. It, it's definitely sturdier than other practice putting mats that I've felt. Mike, I know you opened yours. Why don't you tell us your, your first thoughts and then I'll, I'll kind of go into mine. Yeah, so I mean, listen, Perfect Practice Putting Mats was, was kind enough to send us each our own 15 foot XL uh, mats. And when I opened this bad boy up, I think the one thing that stood out to me more so than anything else was how it had this like lay flat technology built into the mat the way the mat was just pure flat on the ground and you legitimately got a true roll i i didn't know what to expect and when i opened it up i'm like wow i can use this in my garage i can use it in my you know in my hallway in my bedroom it's really can go anywhere it's got two hole sizes you know one for like a regular sized hole and then one a reduced sized hole that kind of makes you practice putting at a smaller hole so that you know the big the regular hole looks right, larger. Aim small miss small it's got the auto yeah exactly it's got the auto ball return so it's not like i gotta go fetch the golf ball it all comes rolling right down to me right where i'm at um and it's got the lines all built on the putting mat so that you can see how the ball is truly rolling throughout the whole mat it, it's one of those things that like you see the pros endorse it and you see DJs on the cover and you kind of just say like, oh, they must be paying him just because. But I can't lie. Like this thing is the real deal. Like I wish I had it all winter because it would have been all in my garage all set up and I would be rolling it left and right. Because I think, again, one of the things that they value is like this crystal velvet true roll technology with her, where there is no skipping. There's no skidding on the mats. It rolls legitimately. They say it like a ten to fourteen on the stint meter. Which, no offense, that that thing moves. It's not like we're at like a a muni that it's bumping and it's going all <laughs> over the place. Like this is a legit mat. If you put it on the hardwood floor, from what I've found out in the short time having it, it rolls faster than the carpet. So like this is a product that legitimately is no joke. It's a super easy setup. It's a super easy put away that like, if you're serious about trying to find ways to practice your putting, like I can't lie, you need to go invest in one of the perfect practice putting mats because they are top level stuff. So I'm going to talk just because I feel like I need to, but you said it all, Mike. <laughs> it really is. Honestly, a couple takeaways from when I opened it was how smooth it was. I didn't realize that it was rolling at like a 14, but it was it was cooking. And it, it's, it almost feels like, Mike, I know you're an athlete. You've ever got x-rays and you get like that x-ray thing they put over you to like cover like your your stomach, your chest, your groin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, you're talking it about. felt kind of like that. Yeah, it's like yeah. heavy as it just like slaps to the ground. And that was the first impression I got was that like this this sucker is is not built cheaply, and they've put the money into where it needs to go. It needs to lay flat. So we're gonna we're gonna give it some give it a little bit of weight to in whatever the material is to make sure that it, there's no bumps and and grinds in it. And the same thing with the surface it is smooth they there's no aerations in this it is it is super smooth slick it rolls and then the other thing that i took away and some of the other ones that i've seen are they're they're flimsier you know you can just feel the material right you can you can kind of like wave it around and it's it's like feels flimsy this you're not waving around and the base of it where the holes are is is like oak, like solid oak wood. It, it's a, it's legit heavy. Like you got to roll it up and like be prepared to carry it because it's not, it's not a drag around the house. Move it. It's movable. It's easily movable, but it's not. It's not like your, like this is a solid piece of wood at the at the back end of it that you got holes into, and then the return part was super. You know, you don't need. You don't need to put nine balls out there next to it and hit your putt and then roll one and then go get them all. This is returning right back to you. All you need is one golf ball and it's it's coming instantly back to you. How how cool how cool with the return 
is that the strips are all magnetic. It all it wasn't something that I had to like break no. apart or worry about a something. It was literally like snap, boom, connect it, yep. magnetic snap, and then putting it away. That was another easy part. Like you see this big fifteen foot thing. Like oh, this could be a, a bear to put away. Nope, un un snap it more or less. Put it unsnap it's like, it, roll it up. Like I I, I rolled it. So that it was like it rolled onto the incline by the holes there, just kind of rolled it. So at, next time I go, I can just unroll it and then straighten it. But yeah, mm -hmm. super easy snap. The snap system was innovative in its ease. And then also you don't need to like, I don't have room for 15 feet in my house, to be quite frank with you. Uh, like uh, I'll be, I'll be maybe at 10, but I can take that back piece. That's going to be like the ball collection and just snap it too. I don't need to, I can put it wherever I want to. It's not like a jigsaw puzzle. If I wanted to putt from three feet, I just put the collection at the end of that. Or if I want to putt from 10 feet, like it was super simple to, to put together. Really a great, a great tool. Um, and if you go back to New Year's, those are my two things. I wanted to get flexible and the putting and I had got that David Peltz thing, which I've been doing a little bit with, but this is just another tool that's going to make it incredibly easy to do and, and just have to do. That's all. It, it's, it's a simple, it's a simple install, simple put away. It couldn't be, couldn't be easier. They did a great job. Yes. Listen, I, I totally agree. It kind of hits both your little goals that you mentioned back in the winter. So again, I, I recommend the audience go check them out at perfectpractice.com. You know, they got amazing products on there. And also I'd give them a follow on Instagram at perfect practice golf all one word um so many amazing videos they're putting tons of content out there all different people support and endorsing their product and listen we're just one of those people that are going to piggyback all these others that that talk so so highly of this product are you sick of the same old golf attire boring shirts hats and belts that don't really match your style well check out fluke apparel company Coastal inspired golf gear. Customers have been raving about the quality and performance of their products from their local weekend golfer all the way to the PGA Tour. Visit flukeapparelco.com and use code DROP to save 20% at checkout. You will not be disappointed. Mike, let's get into March Madness. And while the basketball has been incredible and I've been locked in Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> uh, let's talk about our match, March Madness. We put out our brackets last week. We did full brackets and we did the voting. And we came up with the winners. And I think the biggest takeaway when I looked at the results, and we'll go through all the results, but my biggest takeaway is Rock Springs not making it out of the first round. I don't know if you thought that. Uh, or what your biggest takeaway was, but but Rock Spring not making it was was the biggest thing for me. And honestly, the degree on some of them was also like how either wide the gap was or small the gap was on some that I thought were going to be wider weren't, and some that I thought were going to be closer weren't. So, um, what was your biggest? The one thing you looked at the at the at it. What was the one thing? The one takeaway that you were like surprised with, shocked about, what was your? I mean, I, I guess I, 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 I don't know if I was so surprised, but clearly I wasn't very good when I looked at where I the teams that or the teams the courses that I picked compared <laughs> to actually who won. I know I did not do well looking at my bracket, so my bracket's kind of busted already. Thank God for Nishanik Valley, but I, I will say this about the Instagram and the posts and what what went tra what transpired is. I can't thank the audience enough for the amount of, A, the views that each post got. I, I think we were sniffing somewhere between like four or 500 views on each of the North and each of the South posts, which for us, some people may say that's not a lot of people, but we only have 1,500 followers on Instagram. So yes, basically a third of our followers viewed these, which I thought was unbelievable. And then not only did the views translate into votes the votes were were unbelievable too we were getting votes of like somewhere between three and four hundred votes per matchup 
which again, for guys like us that are brand new to this scene, it's like unbelievable that people not only now are viewing it, but now you're connecting the dots to getting people to vote for it. So to me, like, I can't thank the audience in that respect because I was blown away looking at the numbers. And again, I know I'm a big numbers guy and I, I break it all down and I crunch them, but I was blown away with that aspect of how interested our Instagram audience was in terms of this. So when I dove deep into the, to the North side, I again was stunned, but I guess maybe I shouldn't be again, rock spring. I think we spoke so much about rock spring. Like you, like you just mentioned that I thought it would be a runaway. I did, but clearly we may must be in the minority here because architects not only won, they dominated them from a score of 62% of the vote they received. So it wasn't like 51 to 49 or 53, 47. No, it was a runaway. We call that in basketball, a blowout. That's what it was. Now the other ones, I'd say like, you know, back and forth, you know, we're not the most educated in terms of like these North courses, Northwest courses. So for us, it's maybe a little guessing game. Um, but you can clearly see where the audience lies, where they're from, and and they've played it. And when I look at the North, Bally Owen was the leading vote getter of all the North and South courses of all the votes. They had the most votes out of any course that won. So again, I know people had, I see you're wearing the hat today. I see that. Um, but I do know we had gotten a lot of traction on Instagram and people commenting that it was overrated. Nobody liked it. And maybe the matchup was maybe one-sided to some extent. I don't know. But it was overwhelming, Bally Owen defeating Mercer Oaks. Um, so, I, listen, I, 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 I can't say that, you know, like, I, it was a great first and, round. It was a great first Mike, round. Mercer Oaks was a course that you spoke – Maybe highly is not the right word, but you definitely were like, that's not a dog track. Like, that's got a... No, it's, and it's it, not. Yeah. It's not. It's a 36-hole facility. I get it. The West is 118 of it, but it's a beautiful spot. The facility for practicing is very good. Yeah. Clearly, we got more people following in, in the Bally right. Owen region. Which is, which is uh, good for me because I, I had Bally Owen winning it all. So I, I feel I feel pretty good about that <laughs> still. Um, uh, again, I'm the, I'm the same way. You know, if I look at my bracket, like I had Seaview Bay, I had Hominy Hill. Um, if we're staying in, you know, going to the south, um, Harbor Pines won, correct? They beat um, they beat LBI National. You know, I, I played LBI National 15 years ago, and I haven't played the other. So like, okay, I got that one wrong. Running Deer, uh, I got right. Cape May National, um, I believe I was right with that. And then Ramblewood and Deerwood, haven't played either of those. Uh, I had Deerwood, it was Ramblewood, okay. Like, again, can't really, can't really tell you because I don't know anything about those. Uh, Ballamore, again, I got, it, it seems like that's the big one with, again, I've never played there, but a lot of traction with it. Uh, and then I, I, I went river winds. I was, I was, I guess, trying to be a little too cute in, in an upset, thinking an upset might happen there. Blue Heron Pines is, is again, well, well known, well respected. So I, I went river winds, figure there was going to be an upset somewhere. So what I get two wrong in that one, two, I got three wrong there. Yeah. Um, and then you go up to the North rock Springs. I mean, I had rock Springs in the final four and I think you did too. So I did. Uh, so we got that wrong. Um, again, Berkshire Valley, Mountain View. Um, I had Highbridge Hills, and it was Royce Brook. Royce Brook. I had Galloping Hill, Balio, and Nishanik. So I did much better in the north with with only one wrong there. But the the important part is, I just have Rock Springs not in my elite eight. So that's the important part for me right now. So again. As you stated, we really, uh, I was blown away by the number of votes we were getting on there. That was incredible. So again, people showed out for their for their areas. So we just need you guys to keep showing out. We're going to post these Thursday. You know, we'll do we'll do north or south on Thursday, north or the other one on Friday. Um, shut it down on Saturday. We'll talk about it next week. Yeah, I mean, just to, to keep that going, I mean, 
you know, we'll do the same thing. Thursday, we'll I'll put out the north at noon on Thursday, and then I'll let that run for 24 hours, and we'll put the south out on Friday. Again, I, I do also want to give a shout out to all the golf courses. You, they've been so kind in sharing the posts on Instagram, basically trying to get their crew out to, to get the votes in. And that, that carries some weight. And I know there was a lot of courses that did that. And I'm sure that's kind of why some of the scores may be what they were. Um, but again, if, if, if you're listening and following along, when we post that and we tag you, like share that bad boy. So, you know, your votes continue to, to add up. Uh, Mike, if I'm looking at, at these brackets correctly, you got one wrong in the South. You had Seaview Bay, Hominy, Harbor, Running Deer. And then you've had Shoregate, but it was Cape May National. You had Ramblewood. Again, I think we kind of talked about that was a don't know anything, just kind of got lucky. But one wrong in the South is is awesome. You got Rock Springs. There's two. Uh, you have Darlington, three. Tamarack, four. Hybrid Hills, uh, High Bridge Hills, five. Um, you got Galloping Hill, Bally Owen, and Nishanik. So you got five. I got four. We're in a tight race here. Um, and as we've both said, I, I think, uh, I think we're both competitive people and I'm, I'm just looking forward to kicking your ass in this. That's really what it, what it comes down to. So, um, uh, well, no offense. Uh, you know, the, the real matchup is coming up cup this week. This is it. I mean, when Thursday at noon comes out and it's Bally Owen versus Nishanik Valley, right. that's it. <laughs> that's going to be the end all be all because you got Bally Owen winning the whole damn thing. And I got Nishanik Valley <laughs> and that's happening in the Sweet 16. <laughs> so I don't know, unless there's a, a sleeper in this whole thing that takes out Nishanik Valley or Bally Owen in the Elite Eight, Final Four or the Finals. One of us may just coast on a uh, little right, magic but, carpet right. ride to victory. <laughs> but I don't know how different our brackets are other than that. So, uh, so yeah, this is, this is a big week coming up. Um, I, may, uh, I may or may not, but definitely are going to make some burner accounts to do some voting and, uh, and stuff the ballots. <laughs> but um, there may be a few Finstas out there that, that'll, that'll be voting. But, no, it's, uh, this, has been, this has been a lot of fun. And, and again, seeing the reaction and... Um, hearing people's responses, this is this has been really cool. So again, Thursday, pop out for for your for your course and for our Sweet Sixteen here this week, Thursday, Friday. I will have to keep an eye on now our Instagram. If we start getting about twenty to twenty five additional followers on Thursday around like ten thirty, <laughs> check your phone because I'm sure I'll be texting. <laughs> right where it says user one eight seven nine two six two five nine seven two. Yeah. <laughs> And a little egg as the yeah. avatar. <laughs> so th yeah, this is this has been really cool. Really looking forward to it. And and again, I we've talked enough. I, I don't know if this how you feel about this, Mike. But we said I really would like to go play these courses. Maybe not in the order in which they win, but I, I do think that the course that wins should really be super high on our list of places that we should get to next after this is over. Or first, depending on if we haven't yeah, gotten out yet. That said, Rock Springs is still up there for me. I know that it didn't. I know it didn't move on, but but I consider this golf season a failure if I don't get to Rock Springs. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think we've early on this season, whoever wins, we've got to just pack our bags and and head north or south or east or west, wherever this place ends up being. Because Tough to go east for us. It, it's it's <laughs> fair. Tough to go east. It is. Um, I mean, we could go east and just go to the beach right. that day if we want. But no, but anyway, you're, you are right in terms of like, I do think whoever wins, you know, are going to see these two beautiful faces arrive ready to, to hopefully, you know, fire some numbers. So I do agree that's up there. But along with a lot of these other ones that we've mentioned, unfortunately, Rock Spring getting bounced doesn't change our thought process about getting to that place and playing there. Um, it just puts maybe these one of these other ones at a higher spot to, to make sure right. we get there. And the same thing, like no offense to, to Ramblewood moving on, I still want to see Rock Springs before it as one that I'm just staring at and, and see. So, so as you said, thank you to everybody that voted and thank you to the courses for getting involved. I saw you know, the courses re, reposted, which is awesome. So, so thank you to everybody for, for sharing and popping out there. All right, Mike, moving on to our, our next topic for today is the golf ball. Big news in the past, you know, since our last episode, 
with the USGA and the RNA coming out with a statement that they're going to start rolling back the golf ball. I did not deep dive this. So if any of my information is wrong, uh, I hope you can correct me or as I read more or as more comes out about this, because, it, you know, we are recording shortly after this, this news drop. So, you know, maybe some more will come out. I got a couple schools of thought here and, and just a couple comments. People were talking about how golf's a unique sport that we get to play with the same technology and the same equipment on the same places that professionals get to play. And I think that makes golf very unique. It's one of the reasons why I love going to play Beth Page. Beth Page Black does almost nothing to the golf course except grow the rough thicker. Otherwise, like it doesn't, you know, some courses will grow the rough in and narrow the fairways or they'll they'll do the same with the green. There's really nothing that Beth Page does. And I think that that's a public course in our area that when I do go play there, I enjoy seeing what the pros see. And uh, because I'm sadistic, I like playing the black course from the blues and just trying to break 100 because it is a bear of a course. So there's that point that I like. But also, you look at baseball. College is playing with metal bats. High school is playing with metal bats. So there's different equipment between amateurs and the professionals. In football, the ball is bigger for the professionals than it is in high school and college. Uh, the court is different in basketball than it is in high school or college. And I just, I just wonder if that's kind of where we're going. Like that, that's not something I'm not, while I may not agree fully with it, it's something that I can't just dismiss either for it. That's one thought. Another thought I have is I don't like, well, what do you think of that? What, well, I, I got a few I points, don't but let's, like, let's bounce it. Okay. I, I, I think the analogy of comparing the basketball court to the golf course, in a sense of it's different, so it's okay when you change levels. But I, 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 I don't like that analogy because golf can be played at different tee boxes. So if you're not comfortable playing the 7,000 yards the way the NBA guys play the NBA line, like you move up. So to me, like... It, the uniqueness about golf is that I can play the same golf ball that Tiger mm -hmm. Woods does. The same one. It may not do the same things that Tiger's does, but I get to play the right. same one. And I think that's a really, really awesome thing. And I, and I, and I hate the and fact even the same clubs that now the we're, same, right, you're like everything. It, I, I can, I can mock the best player in the world. My results aren't going to nope. be that way, but I can yeah. do that. And I absolutely hate the fact that we, or not we, the USGA and the RNA may roll back the golf ball in 2026. Mm -hmm. I hate it. I think it's dumb. Golf is at an all-time high. It, every single person since COVID that I know has either picked up the game or started playing more. Why in God's name are we going backwards here? I, I don't get it. And you're going to tell me like the golf course is this, the golf course is that. Like, I hate that. Make Change the golf courses mm -hmm. in a little bit. Put the bunker in a different spot. Back the tees up. And I know you're going to say, well, we don't have enough land here. We don't listen to me. That is why would you change something that is so damn good? No one gets mad in baseball when the guy jacks three home runs. We don't say, oh, we need to change this. Or if a football player throws seven touchdown passes, no one says, oh, he can't do that. We need to change the rule. No one says that. They celebrate it. So if a guy like Tom Hoagie goes and shoots 62 the other day at TPC Sawgrass, what are you going to do? change the ball because Tom Hoagie's shooting 62? Let's celebrate that. Golf is so damn hard as it is. So if it makes it easier for certain people, including the pros who we see at times like Tom Hoagie shoots 78 round one, third round shoots 62, it's so damn hard for these guys. What? Why are we switching right, that golf. up? To me, this is a very stupid suit, quote, suit move that guys that don't understand the game of golf and where it's going are changing for no reason. Just to say they did something. Listen, I, I, I get yeah. fired up about it because I think it's absolutely stupid. It's stupid. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I didn't start with that. I also don't like the rule. I don't think we should be rolling the ball back. This has been a, an argument for 
you know, I heard someone talking about it since like the 1920s. They've been talking about how people are out driving the golf course. And, and I'll be honest, you're only talking about a few professional golfers. And I know they said that it's not going to affect the amateurs where like we couldn't go into the store and buy the rolled back golf ball. And I definitely don't agree with that because golf's hard enough as it is. Let's not make it harder than it needs to be. But I don't understand why this seems like putting a Band-Aid on an issue. And the issue is that there's a few professionals that hit it really, really far. But it's really not doing much. You had Bryson overtake a few golf courses. And okay, he won a U.S. Open when he would plow it down there and have wedge into the green from the rough as opposed to six iron from the rough. And and okay, maybe that's that's one instance. But for the most part, you have these guys who hit it a little bit shorter, still far, but a little bit shorter, and that are be- just better golfers. They need to still be good at golf. Rolling the ball back to me isn't going to fix fix that. And I'd almost rather them uh, this is a little crazy, but I'd rather see more holes that are like 350 yards, 360 yards to where like you're not going to drive the green. So you need to still be good at the other parts of the game. If you can hit it 330 and I hit it 300 and the holes 350, you're still 20 yards off the green. You're still hitting a little wedge on, it's too far for a bump and run. You know what I mean? And maybe maybe it needs to be 370 or something like that. But there's other ways to protect the golf course than just, we don't have enough acreage, so we can't make it any longer. Like the guys that don't hit it far, like, again, like I know a guy like Kevin Kisner is not a long hitter. Like some of these guys, they're still going to have to use all the clubs in their bag or like you said, move the bunkers or change. You know, golf was a golf course built in 19... 19- 1920 bunkers were put in place because that's where the majority of balls were going to be landing. So you had to avoid the bunker. Well, now they're flying the bunker. Okay. So move the bunker then, you know, make it bigger, make the, make it the whole, the whole, instead of it being a a 10 yard wide or 10 yard long, make it 15 so that it still is in play for someone who's trying to go over it. I don't know, it just, it just seems, again, like a, like a Band-Aid on something that, that, quite frankly, I don't even know if it needs any kind, of, any kind of bandaging to begin with, but it doesn't seem to be, it seems to be a get-off-my-lawn, old, old man golf uh, fix to something that, that, quite frankly, I don't even know if it needs fixing. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's different if Bryson is going out there and winning it, right. everything. Right, had he been... Just yeah. because you hit it, just because... He hits it far. He's won a U.S. Open at Wingfoot. Okay, I get it. But that is the exception, like you said, to the rule. The majority of the guys that bomb the ball aren't always winning. They're not. I mean, we could go through the list of guys that are winning right now, and they're all, they hit it far. But no offense, nowadays, golfers are better athletes. They're bigger. They're stronger. They're taking care of their bodies more. Like, yes, that's called evolution. Things will gradually get better as guys are taking care of their bodies better, working out more, like that's part of what goes on. So maybe as we start designing golf courses in today's world, those types of things need to be thought about. Like, yes, are some courses going to be in a sense like outdated that these guys can't play? Sure. Okay. I get it. But no offense, St. Andrews is always playing in the in the British Open every five or ten years, whatever they're right, going. Whatever Rota is. They always no no one complains about them going back to St Andrews. It's all about the history, and all we want to see is fans is like, yes, we want to see them struggle at times to show that they're human. And no offense, they do when they play in that tetra, that torturous mm-hmm. weather over there. Like so, it happens. So the idea that we want to go backwards on something that's full speed ahead going forwards, just to me. Like, I just don't get it. I Because then what are you going to do for amateur events? A guy like Stuart Hagestad, who's coming on the back end of the show, what ball is he supposed to play? He's a top He's a top level amateur. When he goes to the Masters, is he playing the amateur ball? Or is he playing the pro ball? And what about all these stud college kids? Like Jack Wall, David Ford, guys that came on the show. Are they playing the college amateur ball? Or are they playing the professional ball? And now when I play versus you and then we're playing match and we're hitting it the same way and you're like, oh, are you playing the pro ball? Mm-hmm. Play-? It's stupid. Course, it's absolutely stupid. Course records. Stupid. Th- what makes, are the, uh, you know? 
Yeah, it's it's an it, the whole nine. It's an asinine move by the USGA and RNA. And I swear, I pray that the PGA Tour does not adopt this local rule because at the end of the day, that's what it's going to be. Because we all know the Live Tour will not accept this, and they'll promote mm-hmm. the hell out of it. Like, nope, we're not adopting it. And then people will start migrating again that way. It's a stupid, stupid move, and I, I pray, just like Justin Thomas, just like other guys have come out and say it's a dumb thing, I just pray that the voice that really matters in these topics like this is Tiger Woods. I pray that a guy like him comes out and says, let's not do it because we all know when Tiger speaks, everybody listens. So t- to that point, Mike, I think that the PGA Tour, the only thing stupider than this rule would be the PGA Tour accepting this rule because... There's no way that people are going are gonna to be, oh, you're going to roll the ball back? Then I'm going to go to this other tour, which is going to pay me millions of dollars anyway, which seems to be having more fun. You know, quote, it's less competitive. It's more fun. We can wear shorts. There's music playing. I can hit hellacious seeds and, and bombs out there. I'm going to go do that. And I think that that's going to drive yeah, people away. Yeah, you just don't away. want to lose yeah. guys to that tour for that. Yeah, I know. That's what, I just don't want to give them reason to 100%. go there. Again, I don't know if they would ultimately do it, but why give them the reason? So, Mike, I just pulled up 2022 uh, professional golfers with the longest average driving distance on tour 2022. I'm going to go through this list. Okay. How many tournaments did Cameron Champ win? A lot. Of, just give me a lot or a little. Zero. Yeah. Okay. Zero. Three hundred and twenty-one point four is his driving average. What about what about a name Rory McIlroy? He's probably won eleven times. Okay, John Rom. Uh, Rory's three twenty point four. By the way, how many times has Rom won? Just since just when? a lot. Just give me a lot or a little. Yeah. Oh, a lot. Right. Yeah. Rom's right. won a Rory, lot. Rory, good. Rom, good. Cameron Young. I don't think he's won yet. Wyndham he's Clark. Has a lot of seconds. Nope. M- Matt Wolf. Over at Liv. I don't even know who this guy is. Joe Bramlett. Never heard Brandon of Brandon Hagee. Trey nope. Mullinay. I think it's Mullinay. M-U-L-L-I-N-A-X. Nope. Isn't that like the... Tr- okay. But it, but again, what I'm saying, these yeah. are the guy. And there's one more in this list. Taylor Pendrith. Nope. Yeah, I know, right? I've heard of him, but exactly. he's not winning. So you have two guys on this list of 10 who are winning... Like winning um, golf uh, tournaments on the regular on this list. Again, guys might be Cameron Champ is is a guy who's might be in the mix a little bit, making cuts and making money. Cam Young, he had a great showing at the Open last year, but like Wyndham Clark maybe the same thing. Matt Wolf, live, congrats. These other guys like it's not it's not like this list is is full of the top like it's not like this list is the top 10 golfers in the world. Yeah. You have two who are studs, but but the rest of this list, the other eight, you could argue are are journeymen, despite maybe not having long journeys yet. But they're they're like guys that are grinding to make cuts and make some money. They're not the guys who you're betting to win tournaments, except for Rory and Rom. But uh, it it just goes to show that the distance doesn't equal wins. So rolling it back is not gonna is not really gonna do anything. No, yeah. I, listen, I, I completely agree. I, I I totally agree. I think I think you know for me the icing on the cake is like it is at the end of the day a stupid, stupid move. And no, and I'll give you another example. Augusta National, right? Probably the one spot one spot that we all see on TV and we absolutely love. I mean, even Dottie last week talked about the azaleas at the corner on, on number two, like just the visual, the optics, the colors, like. Do you see what they constantly do? Evolve. We got to change the golf course a little bit. Tiger ran over that place in 97. What do they do? Evolve. What do they do going into this year's Masters? Evolve. Like, no offense, people. That's part of what goes on. And I get it. Some places may not have the luxury like Augusta National. I get it. But rolling the golf ball back for every single person isn't the answer. It's not. Do you think they do it secretively like baseball did a couple years ago? Hey, there's too many home runs being hit. Let's tighten up the baseball. And and then no home runs were hit and pitchers were getting blisters more easily and or they died like whatever baseball did and then they were like, uh, maybe we should go back to that. But didn't never officially acknowledge that the ball was different while every player was like that's a different ball. Yeah. And let's <laughs> and let's go 
How many people watch baseball? Baseball is like the dying sport in, in America. I don't care if it's a, oh, America's pastime. I don't care. Nobody watches baseball. They had to change the rules going into this year because it's too damn slow. Like, I get it. People are saying, so is golf, Mike. Are you out of your mind? No offense. You want to talk about the trajectory of each of those sports? One's going down and one's skyrocketing yeah. up. Why are we changing the one that's skyrocketing up? We don't want to be baseball. We don't. So to me, again, like it's just mind boggling that we're going to find a way to, to, to take away or make something even harder for even the guys that still find this game to be so damn hard. It, if, uh, listen, I get fired up talking about it. I've, I've must have read so many things about it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate <laughs> I, it. Can't emphasize I it enough. The, I, I did not expect this to. I did not expect you to be this heated. I know you're a passionate person, but I didn't think. Uh, I didn't think this was going to be a trigger for I hate, you. I hate dumb things. I hate dumb things. To me, this is when like, like, bosses make decisions without ever talking to people that are in the the grind every day. Like, come talk to me. I play every day. So, like, why would the USGA not ask the top players in the world their opinions on a decision like this without doing it? It's the same thing in any profession. Like, at least get feedback. You may not like the right. feedback, but at least you have it. And, and we've all been there where the boss, the boss either doesn't ask for feedback, does something stupid, and then we're like, well, that's stupid. And then they come and ask you, and you say, okay, you should do A, and the bosses go do B anyway. And it's like, well, does it really matter then? If you're not going to listen to me, why, why would you ask me? So, uh, again, it just feels like old man golf. It feels like people who are, you know, they talk about the better days of golf in like, you know, the 80s being the golden age of golf. And, and it's just not the same anymore. Yeah, I, I agree. It's dumb. All right, that's going to be it for us today. Um, we're going to send you to Stu Hagestad. Uh, again, Mike, Mike did a great job of introducing his accolades to start the program. Stu won the Met Am in 2016. He played in the Masters. He's number 10 overall in the Wagger rankings, the number one mid-amateur. Just a stud golfer and a great guy. And as we started, just an easy conversation. The layover test was easy with Stu, and it was, it was great. So here's our interview with Stu. Hope you enjoy. All right. Well, today, man, I, I can't be more excited. You know, when you get opportunities like this, you, you can't pass them up. And today's guest is none other than, none other than Stuart Hagestad. He's, you know, real quick before I start diving into this, because I'm beyond excited to ask Stu a million questions here. But, you know, Stu is the 10th ranked amateur in the Wagger rankings. Um, he's the number one ranked mid am in the Wagger rankings. Now, for you people that don't understand what Wagger stands for, let me let me say this to you. It is the World Amateur Golf Rankings. Yes, I did say the word world. Um, Stu's also a two-time USGA Mid-Amateur Champion, winning it in 2016-2021. He's also a six-time major participant. Yes, I'm talking about the PGA Tour majors, not, not your club majors at your local club. And, and I think the one thing that stands out at, within those majors was back in 2017 when he was the low amateur finishing, you know, T36, which again is, is no joke. Um, and on, on top of that, to, to all our amateur guys out there that, that follow things really closely, you know, he's played on three Walker Cup appearance teams. Um, he's the lone mid-end player on those teams as well, where... Correct me if I'm wrong, Stu, but you've won both 2000 in all three years, 2017, 2019, 2021. We've had a good run. That's what's up. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, so listen, now that I'm, I'm done all like, I'm done all the necessary things. Like, I, I appreciate you coming on here, dude. I, I truly do. Thanks for having me. I, um, no, I, 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 I sincerely appreciate it. And, you know, kind of, as I could see in our texts and our DMs, like, I mean, I just think it's so great when, you know, you get around people that are just as fired up about not just golf, but really competitive golf. And um, it's been no secret. And I've put it out there that I love the Met section and um, the Met area. And I actually qualified for that first mid-am um, at Fiddler's Elbow in New Jersey. And um, I would say that, you know, there's there's definitely a lot of my development, both as a 
player, but also like as a person that have kind of indirectly or directly taken place um, in the Met section. And obviously because they break it up between Long Island, um, you know, north of the city, call it Greenwich or, um, you know, Westchester County or whatever it may be. And then obviously in New Jersey, like I've had the chance to play a bunch down there. So um, no, it's, it's a huge kind of part of, you know, my history with the game and, um, I'm just, you know, I'm honored that you guys would, would reach out and think that I had something interesting to say. Well, listen, it's funny you say it because when I reached out, it's like one of those things like, ah, maybe, maybe there's somebody on the other end that actually responds. And when you did, I can't, I can't lie. Like I stand up, I light <laughs> up, I text Ryan. I'm like, yo, you're not going to believe this. Stu actually responded to my DM. He's like, get the hell out of here. I'm like, no, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. So it's funny that you say you know, like the Met, because, you know, that was kind of like where I kind of like to start here, because, you know, obviously being local guys and, and talking about like your journey, more or less of kind of like where you started as a high school kid, um, you know, to ending up at Southern Cal to to kind of like the household name in the amateurs and in the pro sections as well. And I know you're going to joke around and say, you know, like, ah, I'm a nobody, I'm, I'm nothing, but it's, I legit, my dad's, friends are big time into the show. And I said, I said, oh, guess who we're interviewing tomorrow? And I said, Stuart Hagestad, they're like, oh, the best mid-end player in the world. I'm like, see? So when you try to tell me and go the humble route, I get it. But I also know that <laughs> we know your name carries a lot of weight. <laughs> so like, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Well, I mean, hey, listen, let's start with this. Everyone's really good, right? And every year it, it, gets, it gets tougher and tougher to go and compete, not just with the college kids, um, who it even starts before them. Like, I mean, juniors, look at what Caleb Surratt's doing. Look at what Gordon Sargent did last year. Um, I mean, there's countless more examples. David Ford. Yeah, David I mean, Ford's David Ford one. last year went and absolutely put a beat down on, right? Like, so, um, like Ricky Castillo back when he was going through and he played really well at Pinehurst before he got to Florida. Like, I mean, there's, there's countless examples. So from that standpoint like no i i know what the rankings say and you know i i certainly you know appreciate that and thank you for the introduction but everyone's really good like if you're going to go and compete you got to bring it and i think um again kind of bringing it full circle to to the met section like look at cameron young like i've still never won an ike because i lost to cameron young this <laughs> kid you know with two great parents who would just hit it a mile and it's almost like you know he turned into this world class player that he is today and um, so, you know, there's there's good players everywhere. So you got to bring it. But um, to kind of, you know, answer your question, I, I grew up in Southern California. I went to boarding school um, in South Carolina. Um, another Met guy, um, Max Buckley, went to school. Uh, we went to school together down there. Um, I think he's gotten his amateur status back. He's beginning to play a little bit more. But when I first moved to New York, um, I was working for a firm called KTR Capital Partners, which um, is a private REIT focusing on the industrial sector. So we spent, you know, a little bit of time in New Jersey, and that's where a lot of our kind of East Coast acquisitions were going up and down 95. So, I mean, we would, you know, there's there's a lot of value in Jersey. You know, I, I don't care what the media says. There's there's a lot of, one, great people, but obviously a lot of opportunity in that city and, you know, the port of New York, port of New Jersey. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, before I even knew it, I was spending more time there than, than I ever thought I would in high school. But um so my first year in the Mets section, I reached out to Brian Mahoney, now the executive director of the, the MGA. And, you know, we were kind of talking about a couple events and he was probably just like, who's this kid from the West Coast that's been referred? Like, I'll answer your questions, but kick rocks. And um, that year, the Ike was uh, at Friars. The Medium was at Balti Lower, sorry, Balti Upper. And then the Met Open was at Wingfoot East, I believe. And I just remember like looking at this schedule and I was like, we got to get involved. Like, this is, this is pretty tough to be like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we are just throwing 200 miles an hour here. This is amazing. So yeah, we're coming, we're coming in guns blazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, as time kind of went on, you know, I got to meet more and more people and, um, you know, played on a few carry cup teams, few, uh, you know, French international matches teams. I, I'm sure there's a different name for it now, but, you know, we got to meet, you know, Folks like, you know, Bob Housen, who I know that you guys spoke to recently, um, you know, Brian Comline, obviously Trevor Randolph is a great player. Ryan Snaufer, I lost to in the semis uh, that year at Balti. Um, I mean, 
Obviously, Costanza is a heck of a player. He's what a two, maybe three time MGA player now. He's at least a two time um, MGA player of the year. So, yeah, no, I, a lot of a lot of good friends are, are from the area. Um, I stayed with some some friends, the McBrides, who I know are tried and true to the the Met section, but more specifically to New Jersey when I played in the in the USAM last summer. So, a lot of my close friends are from that part of the country, but again, more specifically New Jersey. So it's uh, it's definitely a part of the world that I get back to every chance I I can. Yeah, there's, I mean, those those tracks alone are just like, and I think that's one of the things that when Ryan and I thought about, or, you know, he came up with the idea and we dove deeper into it, it was like, man, there's just so many good tracks here that you don't even need to step outside, even though I get it that there's other spots. But when you look up and down the state, like, man, it's one gem after another. And, you know, even so much when you, you know, start talking, you know, even the, the west part of the state, like, I know that. You know the crump cup for you is is a big thing and and i know mr house and as ryan can can vouch for me like loved and and talked so highly of that place not only because you read about pine valley and you hear about all these things and you know you don't always know like is that really the case or is that just people talking about it you know because the media does one thing but you know hearing it specifically from a guy like mr house and um, you know, why don't you talk a little bit th- about the Crump Cup itself and then also, you know, your experience at Pine Valley? Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's that's high on my list of, of ones I'd really like to win. Um, I mean, Pine Valley, the way that I kind of look at, at golf courses, you know, I think you can kind of break them down into into different buckets. Um, you know, I think that there's maybe, you know, your favorite experience or maybe the most unique course or. Um, the hardest course or the best course, I mean, pound for pound, I don't know if there's a golf course in the world that is as good, let alone even really comes close to PV. Um, I mean, every hole, you know, especially if you've, if you've done a little bit of kind of golf course, you know, history and architecture. And um, I mean, what, what George Arthur Crump, then obviously a handful of, of different, you know, designers kind of created um, out of that piece of land. And then obviously, you know, what, what Mr. Brewer have, have done and, um, you know, Mr. Davis and, um, just, they don't miss, they don't make mistakes. Um, you know, whether it's for the crump where it's set up really firm and fast, um, whether it's, you know, just having such a great pulse on, on not just the green complexes, but you know, what's, what's, there's a big difference between unfair and just really hard. You could throw another word in there too, but just really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, you know, they nail it every time, you know, they, they, they have such a great pulse on how that golf course plays. A couple of years ago, I lost in the finals to, to Muir, who's another great player. And, um, I mean, I walked off the ninth green and like, I've, I've seen purple and I've seen white, you know, like shades where the greens get really kind of spicy and really just firm and fast. And, you know, they begin to lose friction, but I've never seen like a tint of red. And it literally like a pit, like when you think of like, oh, the course is like kind of beginning to like to red line, so to speak. I mean, we hit our tee shots on 10, which is just off the ninth green and they had hoses out immediately. Cause I think that they knew like, Hey, this is, we're in a good spot. We gotta, we gotta mm-hmm. really kind of, you know, keep a good pulse on, you know, we gotta make sure that they're okay. But um, no, it's, it's a special place. It's, it's an extremely high, um, you know, golf IQ within their membership. Um, it's, it's obviously kind of stood the test of time as far as, you know, different technology advances as well as physical advances and, you know, ball club, whatever you want to look at it. I'm personally, I'll just throw it out there. Like golf's really hard. We, we don't need to, I'm I'm team, I'm team, you know, we don't need to roll the ball back. Golf's really hard as is. Yeah. Um, if they want to make the driver. We say that we say that a lot. Yeah. We say that a lot on yeah. here specifically that's, I, about that. That's golfing in the Garden State. Yeah. Like Colon, if they want to make driver. Golf heads, is really hard. It's so hard. Yeah. Like like I'll be. You know, I think that just admitting that in and of itself, almost, you know, it allows you to kind of just be like, hey, like we can we can make mistakes out here. I mean, if they want to make driver heads smaller, then we can have that discussion. But no, golf is so hard. Like don't don't change the ball. Yeah, and I'm sure when it comes to the Chrome Cup too, like waiting on that like application too, because obviously the more I've read about it, it's it's like they'll find you. You know, they find you in terms of like who they want to invite. Oh. It's not like I have to apply. Um, are those rumors true? Um, you know, I or do you apply to play? What I will say, and I'll speak from my own experience, I think that they do an incredible job of identifying who the best players are 
from the start. So we'll start with that. But then I think one thing that really kind of goes maybe overlooked is there's also a view of, you know, what are, what are these guys like off the golf course? Because I think if you were to look up and down that field, it's very rare and very seldom to find someone that you wouldn't want to spend time with, you know, off the golf course, even if that's not, you know, just hitting balls or, you know, grabbing beers or cocktails or whatever, maybe after, you know, there's, there's so many people I can think of that in a lot of different parts of their life, like I kind of look to as being like, Hey, like in the next phase of my life, like that's, you know, kind of what I want to aspire to be like, certainly, you know, McDermott, um, you know, he's a Philly guy, but obviously has played a lot, you know, in, in Jersey in different capacities. Um, Pat Duffy is another one that comes to mind. So I, I would say that um, they do a great job of kind of identifying great players, but also great people. Um, and then as far as the invitation side of it, um, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. Guys are getting better every year, right? Whether they turn pro and they got their amateur status back or, you know, maybe they've just, you know, not really, they, they got done with college and then went to go, you know, work and say, banking or private equity, you know, for two to four years, and they kind of got the edge and they're like, man, like I really miss competing. So when I won the mid-am, I was 20, I, yeah, so I just turned 25. So I was on the younger side of it. And when I was fortunate enough to get the invitation the next year when I was 26, um, so it was at that point, like the crump was like the next week, but um, in 2016. So in 17, when I was fortunate enough to get the invite. I was the youngest guy there by like at least three years. I didn't really know anyone. You know, I'd kind of had my schedules surrounding, you know, trying to make that Walker Cup team. So like I played in the Coleman and I, I don't think I had played in mid yet that year. Point being is I just didn't really know anyone. And over time, like now that I've played in four or five of them, I've become a little bit older and, you know, made more you know, friends and obviously met more people. And obviously I'm not quite as much of a deer in the headlights. Um, but at the same time, no, everything that you said is, is very true, but, but I think it would be, I would be remiss to not give credit to, you know, the committee and who's ever on, you know, kind of that, that crump invite, you know, committee, cause they, they do a great job. When do those invitations typically come out? Um, you know, they come out handful of months in advance. Like even, even if I knew, like even if I knew it's normally right around like if they try to time it to where it's like not interfering with the the USGA mid am correct? Yeah. Isn't it normally like the 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 tournament itself is typically like either September or October because they don't want to interfere with that tournament specifically, correct? October would be really late. I mean, where so they 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 really it's not just the mid am right because there's also a senior contingent too. So it's also True. The Good point. it's also yeah. the senior am. And then obviously if it's a Walker Cup year, then they have that to kind of throw in the mix as well. But for the most part in any given year, you know, the last event of the season is typically going to be the crump for the mid. And it just depends which year. It's been both. I want to say in 2017, I think it was the crump. In 2018, I think it was the mid. You get the idea. Okay. It's always at like the tail end. So like May, June is, is kind of when they when they, they come out? You know, that sounds right. Right, we don't have to keep our eyes out for that invite. Yeah. I even know we could keep looking in the mailbox now, come May now, hold, <laughs> now hold on. If I legally change my name to John Stewart Hagestad the third and I happen to get one, who's that going to then? Is that supposed to go to you or is that supposed to go to me? I, like, see, who's that? I see you read my Wikipedia page. Um <laughs> <laughs> We did our homework. How, how, yeah. That's amazing how behind they are. They still think I live in New York. Amateur golf, every, AmateurGolf.com still thinks I live in New York, which is which is fun. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, that was kind of playing on like the Masters thing with with what's his name? That Scott like how Stallings. crazy was that? Thank oh, you, Scott Stallings. Yeah, that's know. such a well, wild story. Yeah, how wild was that story? I mean, by the way, what a yeah. great guy to be like. Hey, like I got this thing. I think you're that guy. Yeah. I think <laughs> it's it, definitely not me. It, you know what it, I think it truly does? It truly shows like in the world we live in today that there are still nice people out there because there's no doubt the world we live in can be so controversial and so negative that like the fact that a good person did the right thing just gives everybody like hope. Like, okay, it's not as negative or nasty as everybody says. Like there are still good people. I think that's a, I think that's a great point. And then another one I think that maybe just comes to my mind is for a place that almost notoriously never makes mistakes. Again, talk about places that just, they don't miss. No. Honest mistakes happen. It's all good. Good people, yeah. good people are out there. It happens. Good, yeah, it, good, good always prevails. Let, let's, let, why don't you get it? Let's get into the masters. 
I mean, I, I can't lie. Like, I watched the video. I saw you standing in the shower. Like, you barely could stand up in that thing. I mean, <laughs> was that the one that they came I, I out? thought was you that, were going to bump. Yeah. Is that the one I did this yeah. year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to bump your head on that thing. Like, you were looking around, like, six foot five, you're right. They didn't make him for your height. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> what's that experience like walking through, like, the crow's nest, being up there, like, the champion's locker room? Like, God, you hear the stories and you listen to them, but to be able to experience that firsthand? It's, um, there's there's very, very few places in golf because I think the golf is just so centered around, you know, obviously being outdoors and you think of courses and venues and vistas and, you know, maybe iconic viewpoints or, or walks or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, there's very few places in the sport that have such a unique, tangible um, feel to them like the crow's nest does, right? Like, you know, that there's been greats before you that have, um, you know, not just been up there, but spent the night there. And it's just, it's such a unique, um, again, I I think the word that I would use is like, there's such a tangible feel that's there both from, um, like the physical standpoint, but then also just from like the emotional standpoint, like, I mean, when I qualified for the masters the second time, because the first time you almost like don't really know what you don't know. The second time it's like, there's such an enormous, I guess you could say just opportunity, like hanging at the end of that week, our potential opportunity, I should say. So, you know, you kind of go up there and it's just like, Oh my gosh, like I, I can't believe that this is happening again. Um, so it's, you know, gosh, I, um, and you stayed up there, correct? I stayed up there for a night both times i stayed up there gotcha. after the amateur dinner so like this year um we went to the amateur dinner and i went up to to get to the to get up to the crow's nest you kind of have to like you you walk in the clubhouse you go up some stairs and then there's kind of like a good like dining not a loungy area but it's where the you know the champion's locker room is and um there's definitely like a side door to go straight up to the crow's nest but i grabbed a beer and watched the first half of the ncaa tournament and then you know went on up to bed yeah, that's got, I mean, listen, I, when I, when you, obviously, again, you see the things. So crazy. It's unreal. It, it, like, I think you'd feel like a kid in a candy store. Like you said, the first time you're just like an, you're awestruck. And then when you get that second time, you're like, I'm, oh well, my God, it just. The first time it's almost like you don't know what you don't know, right? Like you don't know, exactly. you don't know what you're going to go through. You don't know emotions you're going to face. You don't know, I, you don't know that you were getting a courtesy car for the week. You get, you go there and you're like, oh wait, this thing's got 12 miles on it. Like, this is cool. Right. Like there's just so many, there's so many like little things that, you know, when you're at the time I was 25, like I literally turned 26, like the day after the first time I played, I mean, you're a child and you go and, you know, there's obviously just, there's like every single day. I mean, you almost like in retrospect, maybe I should have kept a journal because like, you know, for a year or so, whatever, after like, you remember like, like every new thing you do is just so unique and just so life not life-changing but just like life altering in some mm-hmm. capacity so um and then the second time it's almost like you you, you kind of know and you had such a great experience the first time and you're kind of expecting it to you know go the same way the second and obviously you know in anyone that's worked in finance for more than a minute knows that you know past results are no indication of future results or however the expression or legal thing that you're supposed to say is at the very end of an email but meaning <laughs> is um <laughs> Yeah, you just it's it's a special it's a special place. They don't make mistakes. You know, they they continue to really just amplify and enhance the experience, not just for the fan or you and I at, at home, certainly this year. Um, you know, kind of watching on TV and, and the patron and you know, the members and the players, and it's just it's a it's a really, really special place. And it's it's one of the core reasons that they're definitely kind of pioneers of the game as we know it today. Let's, let's kind of get into then like the balancing for you. Okay. Because no offense, like the balancing of, and and I've listened to some of the other podcasts that you were on and, and talked about, like, you know, I, I know the guys at the golf channel, the beyond the fairway podcast. Like I, I listened to your interview there and kind of just like, I I listen, I, I try to like figure things out because, and I know like they even mentioned that, you know, the balancing of a work and the, the high level of golf, it's not like you're shooting 75 with your buddies and you qualify for a local amateur, local open, like it's big time golf, what you're doing. So like the balancing of both them, like someone on your level, how do you do that? Well, I mean, I've been pretty transparent about it in the past, right? Like, so I would play for four months and I would give up 
you know, give up bonuses. I would give up promotions. So, but for four months, like I would go try and chase national teams. Right. So believe me, like the grass is always greener. I look at a lot of folks that are my age that, you know, are beginning to get, you know, different types of incentives built into whatever contract they are, you know, say they're in private equity. Right. So they're getting pref on whatever fund they're in and whatever investments are like, it's not like there aren't things that I've given up along the way. Now I like to think that I've quietly, you know, taking care of my business. Like I went to graduate school, graduated with honors. I made the Dean's list Congrats. through the four semesters yeah. that I was there. Like it's, so no, I, it's right. Like, I, I, was not, I didn't want to bring that up yeah. because I feel like I'm that guy, but like I, no. I read and I saw that no, no, too. No. It's totally fine. Educators are happy for you. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> Hey, listen, like, it's not like I, it's not like, like this time of year, like I don't, I don't play golf. I mean, I'm happy to give you our office number and you can, you can chat to our office. Like I don't, this, but what I will do is I'll do a lot of other things, you know, to try and keep you sharp, right? Um, like I work out fairly regularly. If I really want to, you know, I'll go scratch the edge. I'll go hit balls. I'll go chip and putt. I I like to get to the point, and I'm I'm honestly kind of beginning to get to it now. Now that it's the tail end of January, where like I miss playing, right? Like I miss practicing. Like I want to go scratch the edge. Like there's a desire to like where I want to go, you know, chip, pitch, putt, hit balls, you know, whatever for a little bit. And I think that's a really healthy place to be. I also think it's important just to want to do other things, you know, and to your, to your question, certainly not to call out anyone, but on Wagger, on the World Amateur Golf Rankings website, like I don't play in like four balls. I don't play in, I mean, I, I will play in one club championship, which is, you know, a Friday, Saturday too, I guess you could say. So yeah, like I, I'll admit, sure, you, you caught me, right? But like, I don't, the divisor is up there over how much you play. And there's certainly people that play a lot more than I do. However, you know, I've been fortunate to have played in some bigger things. And I, I think I have a pretty good um, playbook for myself of like how to prepare the right way and, you know, how to maybe eliminate a lot of the noise kind of going into and during events. Um, I know what works for me. I personally love to practice. I don't play a ton. And when I do, it's, it's very intentional. You know, there's always kind of, I would say like a purpose whenever like I do go and practice and hit balls or play or whatever it may be. Um, I'm not a huge fan of like going to the golf course just to like hit balls and putt. like if I'm going to the golf course, like the purpose is like maybe it's to hang with friends. Right. But then it's not to play golf. But if I'm going to the golf course, like with clubs, like there's an intent that's there. Um, and then the other thing I would say is like, I know what events I like to play. Certainly the USGAs are there from an amateur standpoint. Like I know some of the ones that I like to play. And then obviously when it comes down to, you know, like with work stuff, I just, it's almost like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, like during the season, we could call it right. Like, I just, I'm not social. Like, I just don't go out. Like I, I'm not fun you know, I'll be the first one to admit it. And <laughs> I'm, I'm super comfortable with that. You know, certainly like I'll pick and choose my spots. It's not like, you know, I won't like not have cocktails with friends or whatever, but like, again, I think it just comes down to you almost are your most productive when you're really busy. And certainly in the past, like, as I mentioned, like, you know, I would play for four and then I would, you know, kind of work professionally for eight effectively. Um, this year will be a little bit different, obviously, because I'll be here with work. Thankfully, you know, I, I think we have a couple people on our side internally and I've given them plenty of notice as far as like some of the events that I'm going to play in with no disrespect whatsoever to guys that are playing more socially and, you know, going out with clients, say on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it may be. But I, I think that there's an understanding that if I'm, I'm playing in something like there's a reason that it's that I am. And I'm, I've tried to do a pretty good job since, since getting done um, and starting, you know, after graduate school that like, Hey, like if I am taking time off, like to go do this, like there's a reason I'm doing it. There's a purpose behind it that so it's kind of a long-winded way of saying um i know what works for me and you know i've also been really fortunate to have met a lot of people through through the game and, and through playing um competitively and then obviously just like i love to practice so like when you catch people you know on the range on the putting green whatever maybe when maybe i'm very comfortable and maybe you know it, it's just it's an environment and an arena where i'm like very collected, I think in my own skin. So it's not like maybe there isn't commercial value in that way too. I don't know. There's, there's kind of a lot of ways to look at it, but 
again, to answer your question, I, I know it works for me. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. So, I mean, well, I'd say there's good balance. And for you, you you manage your time efficiently and what really truly works for you. So, which, which is which is important. And I think that's good for the audience to see, like, you don't need to be that grinder that's out there six, seven days a week to be productive and competitive, maybe not to your level, but to what we all can can kind of handle. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, when I lived in New York for, until I was, until I went to mid, you know, like I was there and you know, during that time, you know, I was in the office 12 months a year and I was fortunate to to belong to a place in the city where I could hit balls and I had unlimited use of a track man and there was a gym. Like I didn't go out during yeah, the week. That also that's didn't that also didn't include weekends. Like I would notoriously and they're so sweet. I notoriously would like work out until 10, which is when they closed. And I would like go shower and leave at like 10 15. Like I wasn't given the keys, but like I damn near had the keys, right? So there's, you know, and, and that's not to include like, you know, maybe there's morning people, you know, that can go in at five thirty, six o'clock and get their work done till eight. Like if you want it bad enough and I don't have kids, I currently don't have a mortgage. I don't have a wife. So like, I can't speak to any of that. So please forgive me if, if anyone's upset, but maybe you delete social media. Like you can carve out an hour somewhere. Maybe it's 30 and 30. I don't know. Or maybe you just do a putting drill in your office for, or in your house for 20, 25 minutes. I don't know. All I'm saying is like, there's there's ways to, you know, all you're looking to do is just get incrementally better and just to do little things, just to find, you know, some advantage somewhere. And I think that anyone around the country would say the same. You could ask Mark, you could ask some of the best amateurs in the country, you could ask some of the best pros. But, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of a lot of guys know what works for them and they're comfortable with that. Stu, do you have a hard time trying to juggle between like going to have fun at the golf course and be social and then like, okay, I'm going to put in work. And, and I wonder if the higher up you go, the, the more this happens, you go to the course and it's like, okay, I got to kind of decide today is a work day and I'm going to work on my putting. I'm going to work on my drive or like, Hey, I'm just going to go out have some fun, maybe have a drink or two, go, you know, just play. Like, is that difficult for you to, for someone like you to do? I actually, I'm smiling because I really appreciate that question. Um, it's one that I don't know that I've ever gotten, but I have definitely spoken to close friends and people I think that have played at a high level about this. It's really hard for me. Yeah. Now that's not to say that like, you know, I, I can't go out and be social. Like, no, of course, like we've grown up playing, practicing, competing, whatever it may be, certainly I, I can do that. Like I've, it's not like I haven't played in member guests. It's not like I haven't, you know, gone out and, you know, played with someone in somewhat of a commercial capacity, but it's very rare for me to drink on the golf course. And typically if I do like the purpose of the day, isn't necessarily golf or to get better. It's, you know, more like to, to have fun or to be friendly or a lot of times if that does happen, like I'm almost like faking it. Like I, you'll, you'll kind of like nurse, you know, a beer or a cocktail over the course of a period of time. <laughs> that makes me sound super lame. I'll be the first one to admit it. And like, Hey, I'm sorry. The moment we get done, like let's have a south side, let's have a cocktail, like whatever it may be. But like, I, I think it's just kind of the way that I'm wired and the way that I was raised that like, if you're doing something like do it to the best of your ability. And if that's to compete or that's to prepare you know, I, I think one thing I, I did a nice job of when I was younger is like just writing down like practice goals of things I wanted to accomplish. I don't do it as much as I probably should, but like if I feel like I'm in a lull or a rut, like it is something that I will do to, it's almost like a, you know, to-do list or a reminder or whatever, like everyone does it in their own, in their own life. It's difficult to at times separate church and state. And, and I love them both. Like I love being with friends and I love like practicing and like having, you know, a, a good a good grind session or maybe like going out and playing nine and like having a game but it's it's difficult for me to just like go out and just like not care yeah I'd, I'd imagine that again the higher up you go i imagine the harder it is and I, I feel like it wouldn't be the first time i've said it like you gotta you gotta know like what you're trying to get out of golf for the day are you going out there to to really grind and and it's a work day or are you going out there to have fun, enjoy the weather, be outside, maybe have some cocktails, but know the difference in what you're trying to accomplish when you're going to the course. Both are fine, but knowing the difference I think is really important. Yeah, you nailed it, right? And I think that may even be part of the reason that I don't really play a ton this time of year because there's nothing to get ready for. To me, you know, if I wanted to just like go have like a fun athletic day, like you guys are in the Northeast, like I could go find someone to go play squash with or paddle tennis. Like I love racket sports. Like I could, I grew up playing tennis. Like 
you there's or you could work out or like whatever. I think that's just such a salient question and just such a such a unique take because I think that a lot of folks just expect you to like oh well, you're just always playing and practicing like yeah if there was something to get ready for like I'll do a fire drill for two weeks it's a time of year where you know I'm I'm kind of fortunate to look at it in the sense like yeah you, you do get to take like a mental break and you do get to genuinely miss practicing and I think that that's one of the reasons that I've really loved amateur golf the way that I have is because if like a personal rule I have for myself is I don't like to play more than two weeks in a row. If I do go play like two events in a row physically, like we're, we're okay, but like the guys that play on tour for call it six out of seven weeks or eight out of nine or whatever it may be. Like that's crazy. That's wild. So like, just mentally, like you just get, you just, you lose the stamina. And like, I, I feel like, you know, when, when the spring rolls around and you know, like anyone else, like when we, when we hear the the piano, you know, kind of getting ready for Augusta, like you're itching to go practice. And then conversely, like when it's time to maybe, you know, season's kind of over and, you know, September's winding up, it's like, you're almost ready to like do other things. But then, you know, a couple months go by and you're like, man, I, I missed it. Like, I want to go listen to the drop pod and, you know, go chip for an hour. <laughs> I appreciate can, that. We'll cut yeah. that. We'll definitely yeah. keep that one in there. <laughs> can, can I, I, can I dive into the long putter? My baby. Okay. Yeah. I, I, and, and I bring that up because, you know, I think there aren't many people nowadays that, that use the long putter. It's, it is the conventional putter to what extent how you grip it is a different story. Can you tell us a little bit of, of the backstory behind going to the long putter and maybe the why? Yeah, sure. So, I, I mean, the short answer is um, I played so poorly one year at Pac-12s. I think it was my sophomore year that I was just like, like it made putting not fun. Right. And I don't like to use the Y word, but like, it just became like, my confidence was so low. I just had trouble kind of starting it online. And I just, I wanted to just try anything else that was just like almost a complete like change in motor skill or just like, I just wanted to reset. Right. I wanted to just like have a lobotomy and then just like go do it again. Cause like from a, from a work ethic standpoint or like a knowing how to pot standpoint, like I thought I had a pretty good pulse on kind of what to do, but I just wanted like a mental reset. So that was around the time that Adam Scott came out with that article in, uh, I don't know if it was golf week or golf digest or whatever it was, but you know, he had that full kind of, you know, grab the long putter, started rolling it really, really well. It was like a two page spread and got to watch Adam kind of go through his progression as, you know, a young guy on, on tour. And now obviously to, you know, kind of a, a veteran, totally a veteran but you know i remember seeing this and the idea was kind of there and it was kind of festering and then i went out and played la with a friend of mine who was also a new jersey guy named sam fagels and he was a fraternity brother of mine in school and he had a long putter and he was just like yeah which and i was like i kind of saw it and i was like yeah when i try that and like i rolled it okay so i i kind of said screw it let's just go buy a long putter and i started putting with it and it felt weird at first and obviously as time went on i kind of got a little bit more comfortable with it and then i just kind of went back to a bunch of the drills that you know, that I had always kind of focused on. And I, I firmly believe that putting is, is really four things, but it's three and one, you know, it's how often can you start your ball online? Like, great. So you put down the line, we've all seen the worm cam, you know, have it turn end over end. How good of a green reader are you? Pretty self-explanatory. And then how good's your speed? And then obviously the fourth would be, you know, just self-belief. So like the self-belief part, it's almost like a chicken and the eggs. You can't really have one without the other three and vice versa. It's really hard to have three without one. So I, I went to the long putter and I remember playing a USAM qualifier and I made a total mess of this hole. It was in my home course where I grew up in Orange County. And um, this hole should be like four, three or four iron wedge, right? And I've just, I've just made a mess. And I had like a four footer just outside the hole uh, for bogey. My dad came out and watched the first hole before he went to work. I was probably like, I don't know, going into my, my senior year of college and I hit the putt dead center did exactly what I wanted it to do there was no like a flinching it there just there was like I was just super committed and it was almost like this that was like the first putt that mattered and it was like almost like a new look at like golf life in a weird way and it just like it just was so inspiring there was so much confidence and again like the anxiety and the adrenaline were all still there but it, it, I just it was this immediate sense of just like oh great like Let's go have fun. Like putting became fun again. And um, and a qualifying for the USAM that day, I just balled for like basically the rest of that day. That was actually the first time I met Xander Shoffley. We were paired together and he's 
he's had a pretty good run. He, I was like, damn, this yeah. kid's really good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like it just like golf became fun again and, and putting became fun again. And um, so that's, that's, that's kind of the story. It's been in the bag ever since. Yeah, I, I see. And it's just kind of like, obviously, it's a little rarity in terms of nowadays. And, and I know it's always in your bag. I didn't. And obviously, I knew and I read that story regarding like you and Adam Scott and how that, you know, came about. But um, I, I figured I'd ask it anyway. But listen, I, I can't lie. Like, I know how Ryan and I are. And I, I think this is probably like, I don't know, maybe our 10th or 11th interview of people. And I say it every time, like we could probably sit here and talk forever with you guys because we're like in awe of the things that people accomplish and the fact that they're willing to give us a few minutes. Like it's beyond, it's beyond, like we're beyond thankful. So I and we even just wrap super it up easy by to talk asking, to still. Yeah. 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 What yeah. You, Ryan, what'd I mean, you say? I was like, even even just super easy to talk to. It's it, yeah. this is just like such a casual conversation. It's been so yeah. it's well. Been well, so it's awesome. really, and I mean this sincerely. It's it's really easy when you get around people, you know, like yourselves that are just one such fans of the game. But then two, like as I kind of talked on earlier, like I love competing and I love competitive golf. And you know, Michael, I know that if I'm not mistaken, you qualified for the New Jersey Mid Am, or was the was the State Open? State yeah, Open. State Open. I, I thought it was the Met Mid Am. Which one was nah, it? Was State, State, State Open. Yeah, the one, yeah, the one that stayed open. No, this this one was at the ridge at Backbrook. How'd you do? Now I'm just now now I'm just all out of whack. Uh, so I I qualified by shooting 71 and getting in, okay. and then I I went 70 77 no 78 74, and I missed the cut. Okay. Um, but it was it was listen for a guy like me who just kind of like slaps it around a little bit like it was an accomplishment just to get in. Like I mean. Steven qualifying for your state open, right? Like you love to compete. Like you want to get better. I mean, it's just going out and like trying to find like little ways to improve. And like, I think that's just the part of the game that we all identify with and that we all have in common. And like, I could see to your exact point, like I could talk about this yeah. all day. So I just, I appreciate you guys thinking of me to one, you know, have me on, but then two, you know, just to, to kind of, know a little bit of my story and obviously Costanza is such a stud in the Met area, let alone in New Jersey is kind of turning into a New Jersey legend. So, you know, to have, um, you know, our experience together and then obviously, you know, to lead me to this, I, I appreciate you guys. So thank you. Obviously when it comes to golfing here in the garden state, like we like people to kind of share their experiences or their, their favorite spot per se. And I, and I know you're more on the national scene, but you've, you've dabbled here in the state excluding pine valley because we all say like yeah, the serious, opportunities serious. that people get on it yeah do you got a spot um so matita conk's really good really really good i played a um i played a carry cup there i liked hollywood the first time i saw it and then i got a little that then i got a little harder after that um ridgewood was obviously great uh for the usam this year i thought our cola showed out really nicely you know obviously you've got the mcbrides and then you've got you know what's his name jim that's up there too um, that's kind of the czar. So those are the ones I would say that immediately kind of come to mind. Um, as crazy as this sounds, Fiddler's Elbows, where I qualified for that first mid-am, I went to an eight for three playoff and ended up getting in on the fifth playoff hole. I made like a 35 footer right before, like they called it, like, cause it was dark, you know, I obviously Balti, you know, having played, you know, in the MGA, uh, it was the, it's the mid-am that was there. That's where I lost to Snaufer in um in the semis there's just there, there, there's a lot of memories that i kind of have that were like just so integral to my um you know kind of development as as a player but the one i would say that i don't think gets enough credit would probably be essex county i just i think it's really good i think the back nine is fantastic uh, i lost one year to peter kim as well as cam young and i just think it's great I, I think that that, again, that back nine, similar to, to Somerset, you know, the back nine at Somerset's kind of notorious. Actually, Somerset back nine might be the answer. I don't know. The yeah, point being that, is like- That's another gem. Yeah. Yeah. But, that's, but I think that goes to our yeah. point that like, yeah. we sit here, we could sit here and talk about right. this one, that one, and all of them are just like, yeah. oh, well, what, what, what about that one? Oh yeah, well, I forgot about this one. I mean, we haven't even gone into like, uh, what's the one that's like right over, they play the, uh, not Galloway there's, and not uh, not Liberty, but what's the other one that's like right there? It's got the huge American flag that's- uh, Bayonne. 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 Yeah. And then you, you talk about Bayonne. Yeah, that's, that's number, one. That's, number one. Yep. We talk about it and like, that's my number one spot. I I say to everybody, like, 
listen, I'll pay my own way. I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it got going on. I say to everybody, like, you got an opening spot? Like, Mike Poro has no problem coming up. So, like, I've heard a couple people, like, poo-poo Bayonne, and I'm just like, but how? Like, if you were to drop this in the middle of the countryside, like, in Ireland, like, you would have no idea. What they've done with nothing is unbelievable. But that, again, goes to our point of, like, the golf courses here in New Jersey are, are really just... You know, we could, again, we could have a whole show just on from north to south to east to west on all that. Um, so to your point, I, I agree. Yeah, it's loaded. When we were texting back and forth and you were just like, you know, did you have a couple spots in New Jersey that, uh, you know, you could list off the top of your head? And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's there's a pretty good list in the Garden State. <laughs> So, Stu, before we end here, golfers are rather quirky by nature, and we, you know, we have our superstitions and and that sort of thing. What are some of your superstitions when you're getting ready for a tournament, or some of your quirks? I my, see the smile cracked already. My, like, my what, are, what are some things? Your habit. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? That's what I got to start saying because it's. I feel kind of bad. Yeah. What are your habits that you have on the course? Again, getting ready for a, a, a competitive round. Yeah. Um. I I like I like white hats. No reason. I just think they look better. I have very sweaty hands, so I've also I've always got to have a bunch of gloves on me. Is there a certain number of gloves? No, just like just or in just the bag. a bunch. Just, just like, have just, four well, or five in the bag. I, I have okay. a lot. Of, it's funny. I have a lot of practice habits. Like a lot of times, I'll always have like two gloves on me when I'm chipping or putting or, or chipping or hitting balls. Um, I usually and by usually I mean always start the round with like five tees. <laughs> like there's no like I just it feels right. More feels like too much. Less feels like not enough. And like over the course of the round, like if I break them, like I'll replace them eventually. But like, I mean, there's a handful of either it's like two quarters. Like I always keep stuff in my left pocket versus my right. Like I just it was the way I was conditioned when I was a kid because you move into your left side. I'm a righty. I was very superstitious growing up, and then as I got older, um, you know, a mental coach or friend kind of made me like pivot the way that I thought about that. And he was like, "These aren't like while some people call them superstitions." If that's what you do to make you feel comfortable, like that's a habit. Like that's a way of like getting you in a place where you're comfortable and you're ready to go out there and you know try and play your best golf. Dude, I love that. We gotta change yeah. that word to habits. Yeah. Love yeah, that. I, like, I, I, I feel more secure by calling it a habit yeah. than a superstition. Like, I do. Superstition has such a negative connotation. Habit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> Yeah. It's but, like, I oh, think, God, I got... but I think they're they're quirky habits. Like you said, you have to have five T's in your pocket because yeah. less feels not enough to. And but it's like there's no rhyme or reason. Hey. So you're right. It's it, it's not necessarily a superstition. It's it's your it it, it, work, habit. it works. It's all for, of our quirky. Because yeah, I'm, I'm a three T guy. That's what I'm I, I like with. the three T's. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Like I'd, awesome. like would it change if it was less or more? Probably not. But that's what I'm comfortable. With. I've done it forever. <laughs> so that's what I'll keep doing. Right. Stu, well, this listen, was this was awesome. Thank you so much. Of you, this was. Super easy, casual, and even like we were talking before uh, Mike jumped on, it was really great getting to meet you, and I'm looking forward to to maybe someday smack it around with you. Yeah. A casual round yeah. hey, of golf. Listen, I'm, it's and not, I'll bring you up to we, my level. We, 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 can, we, can do, we can absolutely do that. We'll, uh, we'll make it happen, so stay in touch, and um, I'm happy to help out however I can. Listen, I appreciate you know the constant communication, and I appreciate you you know coming on the show and giving us some time. I, 